But it isn't just death uh, due to heat. Many of these deaths occur in elderly people, to some extent very young children as well, but particularly elderly people. But um, heat can also affect people of working age. And this slide just uh, shows you how heat stress reduces productivity. Shows you a study done um, over a 24-hour um, period um, in Delhi a few years ago. And you can see this is the temperature, and it's called the wet bulb globe temperature, which is essentially a way of uh, not just the temperature, but also including the humidity as well. Um, it's a measure that's used to measure um, occupational heat stress. And you can see that um, in the middle part of the day, around midday, of course, as you'd expect, the temperature goes up. And people's capacity to work outdoors in the sun drops dramatically, so that in the mid middle of the day, at a temperature like this, over uh, 30 degrees on this particular index, your work capacity drops to perhaps 20% of what it would be if in the cooler part of the day. So this means that as days warm up, particularly for those people who work outdoors, they are at risk of heat-related injury, but also their productivity uh, will fall. And this could have quite an important impact on the economies, particularly of low-income countries, but also um, other countries based in the tropics and subtropics. But there are many other things as well which are affected by increasing temperatures. This slide shows you the impact of temperature on salmonella infections, particularly salmonella enteritidis, from my colleague Sari Kovats at the London School, taken from 16 sites in industrialized countries. And you can see a consistent relationship as temperature goes up, the number of food poisoning cases also goes up uh, quite uh, consistently. But diarrhoea is also uh, affected by rainfall, and another study by uh, Kovats and colleagues, which is an overview of 36 published reports from low and middle income countries over 50, nearly 50 years, shows that as rainfall decreases, um, there's an increase in diarrhoea incidence in children. And this again could have major public health impacts, particularly in those countries uh, where rainfall will be affected. And it's possible also that hand washing and other hygiene approaches to reducing diarrheal disease may be less affected, uh, less effective where rainfall is low. But looking at the other side of the coin, obviously excessive uh, precipitation, particularly flooding, can have a range of health impacts as well. In addition to the obvious deaths and injuries that particularly occur from flash flooding, you also get in many poor, poorer countries a whole range of infectious diseases, leptospirosis, often associated with wading in flood waters, cholera and other diarrheal diseases, hepatitis, respiratory diseases often caused by people clustering together on um, high land where they cluster for protection, and then that allows transmission of respiratory um, viruses and other infections. And of course, vector-borne diseases as well, including malaria and Rift Valley. On occasions, you can get the opposite. You can actually get washing away of vector breeding sites as well, and that has been recorded. This is important. A lot of health impacts occur secondary to economic losses. You often get increasing uh, poverty, sometimes malnutrition, following floods. Um, and that's uh, important because that drives many marginal populations further into poverty and can increase their death rates. And also you get long-term mental health effects such as depression um, and suicide. I'll say a few words in just a moment about that. Um, also in uh, some parts of the world, very low-lying parts of the world, as the sea level rises, you can get intrusion of salt water into coastal um, areas. And this is an example from Bangladesh, from some colleagues in Imperial College in London. And high levels of salinity, of, of salt in the drinking water, in Bangladesh is affecting about 20 million people due to changes in river flow and rising sea levels. And their urinary sodium levels are nearly double the WHO FAO recommended levels in pregnant women. And they've suggested this might be causing preeclampsia or high blood pressure associated with preeclampsia in pregnant women, which as you can see from this part of the slide, is much higher in the dry season than in the wet season. That may be because of the increased salinity of the water supply at that time. A lot of work going on in that area at the moment. If we look in higher income countries, a rather different pattern, not so many infectious diseases, but mental health consequences are very important. So for example, in the floods near Brighton in Lewis in 2000, um, about 50% of adults showed severe psychological distress compared with 12% of non-flooded controls in the six months following the floods. 
And they also documented, and this has been shown in many floods, increased demands on the health system. People tend to consult more for a range of health problems in the immediate follow-up uh, aftermath of, of flooding. But also extreme weather events such as storms can cause wide-ranging impacts on public health. And this slide shows you the health impacts of Hurricane Mitch some 10 years ago in Central America, 10,000 deaths, 140,000 homes destroyed, 3.2 million people affected. Many disease um, outcomes also affected, both vector-borne and gastrointestinal diseases. And of course, wide-ranging damage to infrastructure services and major economic disruption, with the Honduras, for example, losing over 70% of its cash crops. But other diseases are affected by changing climate, not so much extreme events, but the more gradual change in climate in terms of rainfall and temperature. And this slide is taken from a paper some years ago by Simon Hales and colleague in The Lancet, where they looked at the population at risk of dengue fever um, in 2050 without climate change and if climate change is allowed to go on in an unrestrained way. And you can see that nearly a billion extra people are at risk of um, dengue um, under this climate change scenario. They'll get dengue, it just means that the, um, there is a, a greater risk of them um, being exposed to dengue uh, if that should happen. In the case of malaria, much of the concern is at the edge of distribution of malaria, not so much in the, in the centre of Africa where there's already uh, obviously endemic, but more in some parts of Africa and other parts of the world where you've got these high altitude sites. So for example in Zimbabwe, you can see that um, these very dark red areas are where climate is today highly suitable for malaria transmission. And these lighter green blue areas are where it's not so suitable. So that's today. And then if climate change, and in, as you can see, that's in the highland areas of Zimbabwe. In 2025, you can see that those red areas have encroached on the highlands. So very few of the highland areas of Zimbabwe are now out of the range of, of um, malaria transmission. They've now become a high probability of transmission of malaria, if all other things being equal. Also schistosomiasis, there may well be changes in schistosomiasis transmission. This is examples in China, taken from this paper published in 2008. And in 2000, you can see the risk map of schistosomiasis transmission, the green color here. And in 2030, uh, with climate change, you can see this blue color, which is the predicted additional risk areas. So it does seem to be likely that there will be shifts in transmission pattern of this common uh, disease in, in China. But over and above infectious diseases, climate change may also have an impact on malnutrition. And this shows you the model impact of climate change on global cereal grain production, the percentage change between 1990 and 2080 um, uh, as a result of, uh, of climate change, all other things being equal. And what you can see is that overall there might be a slight decrease, probably an increase in developed countries because their climate becomes warmer and can support more grain production but low-income countries, there's overall decline, which is particularly marked in South Asia, but also seen in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia as well. So this causes us to be worried about food, protection, food production, particularly for poorer populations. As you can see, really focused in some of these countries, some of which, particularly in Africa, also have high population growth. And the impacts of, on food prices of global temperature increases are generally thought, and there is quite a diversity of models with different assumptions, but they all seem to agree that once you get beyond about three degrees of temperature, you start to get increasing food prices. And what that means, of course, is that the poor will be less able to afford food, and therefore there are likely to be increases in malnutrition um, in years to come as the temperature warms, certainly once we get beyond about two to three uh, degrees. And if we look at the relationship between those countries that have emitted the gases, um, such as US, um, UK, Europe, um, and those that are going to, uh, and those have less, emitted less gases, so for example, Sub Saharan Africa and Latin America, so that shows you the uh, sort of cartogram, a sort of diagrammatic depiction of the historical responsibility for those greenhouse gas emissions. And the next slide shows you where the impacts are likely to occur. It doesn't mean to say there won't be impacts in the north, there will be, 
but the predominant impacts are likely to occur or thought to occur in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. So there is, I think, quite a profound ethical issue there that the countries that are most responsible for climate change may not necessarily be those that um, su suffer most adversely as a result of it. What about here in Australia? What are the likely impacts on health? This is taken from Tony McMichael, uh, McMichael's work. Um, he suggests there are three broad categories. Those are already apparent, current probable impacts, and predicted future health impacts. Already apparent, increases in the number of average number of uh, annual heat days, some impact increase in deaths and so on, and bushfires. Probable impacts on diarrheal diseases, food poisoning, air quality, and probably mental health, particularly in rural regions, as they become warmer and drier, agricultural output uh, reduces. And predicted future impacts, obviously more extreme weather events, water shortages, mosquito-borne infections, and thermal stress in outdoor workers. So that's his analysis of the situation here.